Didn't you get an offer to sell the company completely for $400 million? Yeah, I did. So that would have made you... Super f***ing rich. So in that space of like 12 months, you're on Forbes, husband leaves. Nasty Gal goes under, then Netflix comes out. You know, there were headlines like, does the failure of Nasty Gal mean millennials aren't ready to lead? Why didn't you say yes? So Nasty Gal fell apart after 10 years. It was a slow rise and it was a relatively quick fall, a couple of years in the making. And when it did fall, the headlines were crazy because I had had all this press from this book I published and being the poster child of entrepreneurship, going on the victory lap. National Enquirer said, had you know, a picture of me and it said rags to riches, like straight up tabloid American dream stuff, like a caricature. And I didn't realize the amount of responsibility I had to like other people as an example, like I kind of did, but as some symbol for entrepreneurship or my generation, you know, the generation of the entrepreneurs coming up behind me, or at least what the press thought I was re responsible for. The, you know, there were headlines like, does the failure of Nasty Gal mean millennials aren't ready to lead? It's like, wait, how is one example representative of a generation? And I've also read headlines like when the Netflix series came out, the worst thing about Netflix's girl boss is its source material. Not even the show, just me. But I'm not bad. I don't believe, I don't believe it. How does that make you feel at the time though? By the time that Netflix series came out, I had been this hero as an entrepreneur. Then I was this girl boss because I wrote a book called Girl Boss and it was pink and I was like this and I looked like I knew what was up, but I was like 27. And then there was the me whose company fell apart, the CEO. There was the girl boss who had built a toxic culture or just no intentional culture at all that like warped into something that wasn't perfect, but wasn't, I still don't think it was the worst. And now this person, this conflation of all of those things with this girl on the scripted comedy, which came out four months after I left Nasty Gal. So the biggest kind of personality or whatever identity crisis was, you know, I'm on the cover of Forbes in June, I think of 2016, July of 2016, my husband of like a year's like, May I changed my mind and I'm like, oh my God, that wedding was so expensive. It was devastating, but I'm just like, God, that wedding was so expensive. It was a great party. So in that space of like 12 months, you're on Forbes, husband leaves, Netflix comes out, Nasty Girl goes well, under. Nasty Girl goes under, then Netflix comes out. Uh, ooh. So the show had been shot when things are all like up and to the right. And, you know, we were working through challenges. There had been some layoffs, but the company was still, you know, $100 million a year you know, not profitable anymore, but a great brand and something that was valuable. And eventually, um, yeah, like fell apart. And that the conf there was really a conflation of the, the hero, the failure. And now this girl four months later, who's a, a caricature of a person I was when I was 22 in a scripted comedy playing someone named Sophia, starting an eBay store called Nasty Gal, when for the first time in 10 years in my adult life, since I was 22 years old, I'm no longer associated with the thing that I had built. And now there are 130 million homes in 195 countries watching a story of someone that I was no longer and no longer had trying to move on and to move on when there's a full PR campaign about who you used to be. You're someone who's, as you said, you've had a long history with mental health challenges. What is it like in that, in that 12 month period? What's going on from a mental health perspective? Mm, I had fallen in love again. I think I was still like traveling. I started another company. I maintain my mental health partially because I keep going. You know, I don't stop and like 
lick my wounds. I think I was also, I was also on antidepressants. I wasn't jumping for joy, but I also knew that there was a huge community that still supported me who had read my book, 500,000 women who bought it. And I went on to start a company called Girl Boss right as the Netflix series was hitting, put on our first conference and I had my podcast and I moved on quickly. And even though the headlines weren't nice, the people who followed me, my friends, my relationships, everybody in my network, nobody bailed. Like the girls who were inspired by Girl Boss were refreshed that I had face planted publicly because everyone else is face planting in private. And in the same way that watching some random community college dropout from Sacramento start a business with an internet connection and a computer it gave them license to, you know, yes, they were inspired, but also embrace their own failures because the hero face planted publicly. And that can also inspire people. This is hopefully the most cliche question I ask, but um, I want to I want to know because you have a from your from that experience you have amazing feedback, you have amazing insight, invaluable insight I would say because when I think about the things obviously that have taught me the most, it's not it's not when things go right that's a validation of your hypothesis. It's when things go tragically wrong and you go oh okay fuck mm -hmm. you have all of this new information about which has corrected your hypothesis. So when you if we go back and think about that fundraise for example. Um, a lot of people will hear that you raised a company, raised investment at 350 million and think, amazing. That's when people clap, right? They, they get the champagne out totally. of the oysters. For people listening that aren't in business, they might not understand how that can also be a key reason why the company ultimately went under. The 350 million, why, why did a big valuation hurt yeah. you? Yeah, I think the $350 million valuation is celebrated as it was and how wealthy I was on paper. Um, was the was the nail in the coffin. I think it was it was then in 2012 where we were overvalued and the expectations that was was that the next round of fundraising that we do is at a over a billion dollar valuation. And so the company's doing, you know, on an upswing to twenty eight million dollars in revenue. That's like over 10 times revenue. And it's a fashion business. This isn't a technology business. This isn't Uber. This isn't an infinitely scalable marketplace. It's e-commerce. It was a different era of e-commerce. It was pretty early. It was the era of fab.com, which like imploded. And One King's Lang and, and Beach Mint and Shoe Dazzle. There was no playbook. There were no e-com veterans or you know, performance marketing people who had been in those jobs for even very long. I was hiring executives who had worked at like Macy's, right? Um, nobody had like e -com. It wasn't called direct to consumer at the time. It was very, very different. There was no Shopify. And we were overvalued. And I didn't know that. I didn't even negotiate, you know, hardly negotiate. I didn't shop a term sheet around and say, I'm going to pick the highest price from different investors. I only had one term sheet and I was like, great, I like you. Index ventures, which yeah. are uh, I was like, you're phenomenal. awesome. You can, I, you get it. You know, what Danny said when he invested uh, was something none of the other potential investors said. And that was, you have a community. And I was like, yeah, we do have a community. But when you have that much money, you don't know there's been a nail in the coffin or that there's a coffin and that like you might be on your way into it or maybe already laying in it, but just several years in the future. And when things are up and to the right, you don't see what's lurking kind of below the surface. So when the tide lowers, right, you see the mud, you see weird crab shells, Sometimes, hopefully not, you see trash. And it's only when things recede that you see the mud that's underneath. And when you're on a victory lap and you're hitting milestones, everything's great and everybody loves their jobs and you're a hero. And as soon as things go a different way, as soon as there's 
layoffs. Yeah, there are things kind of there are things there are things lurking below the surface that were dynamics that were already happening that because everything was going so well, you know, were harder to notice. And, you know, it's hard to be a CEO. It's hard to be a founder. I think something a lot of people don't realize is that you only know 10% of what's happening in your organization and hundreds of employees. And ultimately, everything was my responsibility, but I'm held accountable for 100% of what's happening. And when something goes wrong or something's mismanaged or someone has a bad experience in the company, the assumption is that I have signed off on it, that that is how I want things to be. And these things are happening, you know, cattiness and, you know, fiefdoms and silos and duplications of effort and all the, you know, the entire spectrum of things that are no fun at a fast growing company. I didn't know were happening until we laid people off. And then they were like, hey, we didn't like it there. I'm like, okay. And some of that was totally overblown. But also anything that any employees ever said about me or I've read, even though I don't agree with all of it, has been an opportunity for me to learn and take from that how I could be better because there's truth to almost everything. Didn't you get an offer to sell the company completely for $400 million? Yeah, I did. I owned 80% of it. So that would have made you, you know, quick maths, I don't know, very fucking rich. Mm -hmm. Super fucking rich. And why, why didn't you say yes? I went to my investor and I said, what do you think about this? And he said, you need to ask for more. I controlled the board. I owned... You know, I own the majority of the company, but I also took advice from people who I thought knew more from me. But I didn't know that my interests weren't necessarily aligned with the interests of my investor, whose interest is to, whether I'm worth it or not, have a piece of paper to show his investors that says I'm worth, instead of 350, look, they're now worth a billion. And they just make up these numbers and then they can show their people that your company is worth more. And that was his, that was in his best interest. And that's what he was giving me advice based on. Are you mad that he said that? I'm not mad. I'm Do you wish you made a different decision? Is that a regret? It's a, it's a partial regret, but I also know that no deal actually happens. They're not a, a real acquisitive company. They could have tried to acquire the company. I don't even know if they've acquired anything integrating it into their company. If I had an earn out, based on them, you know, controlling it and me trying to hit performance benchmarks, even if I had sold the company to them, who knows how it would have played out. I would have made a bunch of money. My life could have been miserable. But 99% of the time, deals fall through. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor. Become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously. And the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests. Uh -huh.